I'm Aloni Bhatt, and welcome to this special conversation on ET Campus Stars, our hunt for the brightest engineering talent. Today, we delve into the big challenge of employable engineering talent and the disconnect between curriculum and the skills that the industry expects, and how companies like Skilllink are enabling the employability of Indian engineers. I'm very happy to have with me Surya Narayanan Paneer Selvam. He's the co founder of Skilllink. Surya, welcome to Economic Times. Hi, Meloni. How are you? I'm well, thank you so much. It's uh, really a pleasure to have you here with us. You know, why don't you start by telling our audience a little bit about yourself and Skilling? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here, Meloni. Um, so I'm, I'm Surya. I'm one of the co-founders at Skilling. And uh, at Skilling, we focus on upskilling engineering students in core engineering domains such as mechanical, electrical, electronics, civil, and also computer science engineering in order to make sure they have the right engineering skills that kind of helps them get really high quality jobs, right? That is, I don't know if uh, you know, I, I do not know if you know this, or uh, it's a fact that India contributes to 25% of engineers that graduate every year, right? But India also is, essentially ranks lowest on the engineering quality, right? The quality of engineers who graduate and their employability has always been a problem, especially over the last two decades. And uh, nobody has tried to solve this. There are a lot of players in the computer science education stream, which are trying to solve, especially in the mm -hmm. full stack web development or data science. But if you think about this, um, there's no one focusing on mechanical, electrical, electronics, or civil engineering. And that's that's what we want to solve for. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer. I did my undergrad in India and my, and my master's in the US and worked there for a few years. And uh, our experience, both Saran and my experience in the US, uh, helped us understand what we lack in India. And uh, we wanted to come back to India and build it from India to help engineers get real high quality engineering skill sets. All right, you know, that's wonderful. And we'll uh, sort of dive a little deeper into uh, some of the points that you already mentioned. You know, uh, you your company provides courses, as you said, in mechanical, electrical, civil, uh, and computer science engineering streams for students worldwide. You know, why don't you tell us a little bit about the models that you have, the formats that you've set out, you know, just so that the students who enroll with you have that industry relevant foundational technical knowledge you know, uh, that you say um, many students lack. Exactly, right? So we'll kind of go back one step, right? What What is the problem with engineering students, right? So Indian engineers are really good in the theory aspect of it, but they mm -hmm. do not know how to apply the theory in and solve real world problems, right? In order to, if you want your engineers to solve real world problems, then you need to essentially give them the experience of solving real world problems, even in their academics, right? And uh, if you think about our course curriculum, that's how we have developed our course curriculum. So we work with almost 1,250 experts in the industry and work with them to understand what are the problems that they work on and incorporate that in the coursework and also partner with software providers, right? Say, for example, right. uh, companies like MathWorks, Dassault Systems, Siemens, um, Ansys, Alter. So these are all companies that develop softwares where engineers can design or simulate products, right? Uh, so we partner with them so that our students also get access to these softwares, apply their engineering theory to on computational tools, to solve real world problems. So essentially it's three, three, uh, three things. You need to have very good understanding of fundamentals. Then you need to apply these fundamentals to solve real world problems. But how do you solve real, pro real world problems? So you can solve real world problems on a computational tool, right? So just to kind of make this a little easier, right? To, to understand. So mechanical engineers design cars. Right? How do they design cars? They do not go and essentially design cars. Uh, they do not build a clay model and then essentially say, hey, this is what uh, our car is going to be. So they use a software called SolidWorks or Catia where they develop a 3D model. Right? Once a 3D model is developed, then they need to perform a crash analysis or n number of analysis. Right? Say, for example, how do seat belts, airbags are tested? Right? Not after the car is manufactured, even before the car is manufactured, you need to test 
how how the how the impact is going to be when a crash happens this is happening in a software called hypermesh and radios right so these are the tools that students do not get exposed while they are in a college and these are the tools and the projects that we expose students through our coursework right so we the way that we have built our coursework is we work with experts pre record the coursework that the experts essentially say these are the material and the assignments and the projects these pre recorded courses are accessed by the students then we have roughly 250 experts in house who get on a one on one call or a group session every day to help these students clear their doubts or revise concepts in order to make sure that they learn these concepts full fledged all right no so that's pretty in depth but you know this space is extremely crowded surya so you know how do you differentiate yourself like what is it that should uh, that you think attracts students to skilling a oh, great question meloni yes edge ed tech by in general is crowded uh, we can essentially split ed tech into k12 and higher education and we are into higher education right in higher education there are a lot of players in the computer sciences domain right mm -hmm. teaching artificial intelligence machine learning data science or full stack web development but right there is no platform not only in india but across the world even the courseras of the world do not focus on particularly upskilling a mechanical engineer or a civil engineer or electrical electronics engineer to get the right technical skills to do well in that domains right let me let me state why this is a important problem state right um you you and your viewers might have seen all your the infrastructure in india is generally getting improved so all the cities yes. are essentially having a metros or the widening of roads are happening the ports are getting expanded right the prime reason for this is essentially the government is putting a lot of money to develop the infrastructure so that that can be a lot of manufacturing plants that can be installed in india because if you one of the there are two big things for manufacturing right cost of raw material and manufacturing is one cost item but logistics is the second cost item yeah. right so in order to make sure you have ease of logistics ease of movement from one place to another you need to have big roads you need to have multiple uh, transportation modules right and this is where the government is essentially putting in a lot of effort in widening roads and what not right and in the other structure there is a lot of production linked incentives in the semiconductor in the semiconductor industry in electric vehicle industry in defense in uh, mobile phones right like uh, uh, the plis so i think i read a statistic uh, in 2013 Ninety-seven percentage of the mobile phones, of the smartphones that were used in India, were manufactured outside India. In 2020, that is ninety-two percentage of the smartphones were manufactured in India. Right? The difference was, I think, somewhere in between. There was a PLI for electronic items, which right. incentivized uh, companies right. to manufacture from India. And and this PLI is again happening in across different sectors. Right? And we feel that the for while the nation is building uh, capacity and trying to bring people to build from india one of the main reasons why all the companies look for india is we have the highest number of engineers we have english speaking engineers right now the problem is while we have more number of engineering engineers who can speak english are they qualified technically in order to do well in these companies and that's where we come in that's where we position ourselves to help these engineers upskill themselves in order to crack these job roles and and become and build really good products and make india a product nation right a true product nation all right that's you what know, we differentiate ourselves from no that's uh, it, that's very important especially given all the boost that the government is giving you know the msmes and industry uh you know through the pli schemes uh just so that you know we can amp up when it comes to manufacturing uh but you know surya the recent all india survey on higher education 2020 2021 it reported that the enrollment to engineering programs in the regular mode has dropped by 10% so uh it was uh, uh some 41 lakhs in 2016 2017 it's now dropped to 36.6 lakh in 2020 2021 and apparently engineering is the only program that's registered a dip uh, while admissions to ba bcom bsc all shot up 
you know, so I have two questions here. One is that we are now uh, raising a lot of questions on the employability of most engineers who graduate. And you say that's where you come in, you know, because you want them to be able to find the jobs and be able to be employed in those jobs which are being advertised in India, because India is really the destination in which, uh, you know, a lot of foreign companies, a lot of multinationals and a lot of local companies also looking for engineering uh, talent. But would you say, you know, with what you're seeing, that really it's the entire engineering education system, the fact that you exist, it's in a crisis and that needs to be overhauled? No, yeah, absolutely, right? Like the engineering, we, so this is what we say usually. Uh, we are, what we do is like, we are putting band-aid after the problem has occurred, right? The, we are not solving the problem even before it has occurred, right? Like a, uh, it's a good fix to the problem, but we are not doing a RCA and kind of fixing the problem itself, right? But I see uh, over, the, over the next four, five years, uh, I think with the NEP kind of kicking in yeah. um, and uh, the NEP has a great thought process in it, right? Uh, with uh, NEP kicking in, what, what will happen is oh, there will be a slow decrease in the number of engineering seats that are being filled which will naturally kind of say, hey, okay, there is your low hanging engineering colleges will shut off. And then every engineering college, which needs to sustain itself and deliver value, needs to deliver value to the students. In order to deliver value, they need to essentially understand it is not just aptitude or vocabulary or communication training that they need to do to get students placed in a CTS, TCS or a Wipro. Now they need to essentially train people technically. Right and uh, and or and we need to engineering colleges need to understand that and quickly start fixing that, um, and, and that's what we see as an opportunity, right? If these engineering colleges do not fix themselves, right? We want to partner with engineering colleges and we do partner with the governments uh, and engineering colleges to help them uh, kind of change their curriculum. But if the engineering colleges do not change, right, uh, are too rigid then it kind of creates an opportunity for a third or a fourth uh, player in the market like Skilling or other tech companies to kind of build an alternate platform for engineering education, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a cycle, right? Like uh, the population of India is only increasing, right? Uh, I think uh, uh, we are greater than China by the end of the month uh, uh, in population. And we are the uh, largest young demography, uh, right? And with all of this going in, if we miss the bus, on upskilling these engineers, we'll really miss the bus in essentially moving from a developing country to a developed country, right? So it's what we are trying to do is making sure that uh, uh, we impact more people so that they do not uh, miss the bus. But our goal over the longer tenure is to kind of see how we can become the destination for engineering or how we can enable engineering colleges to become better engineering colleges, right? Okay. You know, and we wish you all the best. Uh, but Surya, I'm curious to understand that, you know, when an engineer comes to you, uh, what is the knowledge gap? What is, you know, uh, would you be able to quantify it? What is the skill gap? And, uh, you know, at the very minimum, what's the sort of training that these, uh, you know, engineers need to go through? You know, you, you spoke earlier on about how uh, you are, you know, offering them software through which they can learn, uh, you know, things that they are not able to kind of do in colleges. But if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Maloney, um, I, I, I don't know if you're an engineer, but uh, I'll kind of give you a quick example, right? Uh, a student who finishes uh, undergrad, right? I, again, I don't like to generalize. There are great students who kind of go out all or in all their own um, and, and kind of do a lot of things. But a majority of our engineers essentially are uh, going through the curriculum. And the curriculum mm -hmm. is very theoretical. And the essentially, say, for example, a mechanical engineer who comes out of college, right, uh, might not know uh, if they want to be become an automotive design engineer, will not know how to design a very simple, small component, like like the side door or your, uh, your steering wheel, right? They might not know how to design that, right? What are the fundamentals that go into that, right? So... And that's the kind of gap. So primarily, if, when I was in a, me a mechanical engineer, I knew how to draw a rectangle. 
how to draw a circle <laughs> and uh, uh, and how to kind of extrude that in, into a cube, right? Uh, that's the primary thing that I knew, uh, but that's not enough, right? Like, uh, so, so what we do is we take students and uh, let them go through roughly around eight months of training. Uh, they spend yeah. 400 to 600 hours in essentially these tools, work on at least 40 projects, right? Uh, uh, during this time period and build a portfolio that they can showcase to their uh, potential recruiter and get recruited, right? At the end of the day, if a student, we believe that a student in order to become a very good engineer needs to work on projects. And that's what we focus on. We help them work on industry relevant projects that will enable them to become a better engineer. All right. So, you know, on top of the uh, four years that they have to do, there is this eight month plus uh, that they have to factor in, you know, if they have to become a good engineer. Yeah, that's the, while it's unfortunate, uh, if the way that we see is, we did not have that opportunity. If there was an right. eight month program that we had, we would I would have taken uh, definitely, but did not have the opportunity to kind of uh, spend that time, right? Um, but but the, the future goal is how do we make sure that when they spend that four years itself, we can mm. impart this knowledge, right? Like, right. Uh, and and that's that's a goal for us uh, over the next few years. All right, you know, uh, all the best to you. This is now my last uh, question to you. You know, uh, you're focusing on core engineering fields, as you said right at the beginning, like civil, mechanical, and electrical. Uh, but when you see student interest now, you know, how does that compare to say interest in a computer science, biotech, you know, AI, ML, which uh, you know, a lot of students now want to get into. And what's the impact of uh, this shift in student interest? I think uh, I think it goes to what students are exposed to. I think uh, students are more exposed to a lot of IT uh, and software jobs, and therefore they are more inclined towards becoming a IT engineer or a software engineer. Uh, that's natural because over the last twenty years, India has been an IT hub. Right, and and that's what the focus has been to, towards as well, uh, and, and that's where the job creation has been primarily, um, and also paid a higher amount. Um, so students are wanting to go there, but what they are also realizing is uh, there are opportunities in the core engineering sector as well. Right, right. Again, if you ask me, uh, what is the comparison of exposure? Uh, the comparison is obviously computer science has more uh, exposure uh, about the job opportunities. Engineers are more exposed to computer science job opportunities, but India is essentially getting a lot of opportunities in embedded systems, in uh, construction project management, in buildings and uh, buildings, metros, designs of building metros, a lot of automotive electric vehicle design and development, right? So a lot of these are coming up. And uh, one of the focus areas for us is also to kind of how do we educate people in these opportunities, uh, about these opportunities, and also kind of expose them to these opportunities so that they understand it's not about only information technology or software, there are other opportunities as well, right? Uh, and, and that's that's the uh, hope that we will essentially be able to kind of communicate the opportunities present and also help them upskill in those uh, skill areas so that uh, we as a nation kind of move forward. All right, you know, and uh, we wish you and your organization the very best. Surya, it's been really a pleasure speaking to you. You know, thank you for being candid and, uh, you know, for sharing with us your views on the gaps when it comes to engineering education and how skilling is uh, attempting to help students bridge those gaps. Thank you very okay. much for your time today. Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much, Maloney. Uh, it was a pleasure speaking with you. Our pleasure to have you.